So now, would you turn to the person next to you and ask them if they are ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? And tell them that that was just yesterday and today we are moving forward. We are moving toward another anointing and they, you need to be ready. So get your pen, get your, your, your notebook because we are about to learn other powerful stuff. And I'm so sure we will leave this place again refreshed and refilled spiritually. Amen. So, ladies and gentlemen, would you please help me welcome Apostle Mukisa from Harvest Church. Please stand up. Thank you so much. Now, we, we learned that we need to uh, uh, recognize the anointing now. I was asked to pray for him, and now I'm wondering how am I going to pray for an apostle. But if we all stand and we all stretch our hands towards him, I believe that should be enough in order to pray for an apostle, right? Yes, please. Um, let us pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, here we come before you this morning. And we believe in you. We believe in the words that you put in the mouth of your servants. And Lord, here we are. And you have sent an apostle before us. And Lord, we open our eyes, our mind, our spirit, our heart to receive what you have put in him. And Lord, we pray that as he opens his mouth and speak to us, Lord, our heart will be a soil that is ready to receive the seed that you're ready to plant today. And we thank you, Father. Let your blood, let your spirit cover him as he speaks to us. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Wow. Thank you so much. Good morning. I'm glad you came back. After yesterday, I wasn't so sure, but God is good. Thank you for being here this morning. Those who are watching us online, thank you for joining us. My name is Mose, and I'm privileged and honored very much to be here this morning. And Pastor M and Pastor Caro, thank you again for your uh, friendship, mentorship. I tell a lot of people that you are our mentors, and it's true. And it's great when your mentors are also your friends. And then they also invite you into their space. And then they introduce you to other people. Now there are people that I know in the world because of Pastor M. It's interesting that when you are part of a, a global church family, uh, I keep telling people that promise Jesus made to his disciples that no one who has forsaken, who has left behind a uh, house, ETC to follow me. It says you'll have in this world and in a life to come a hundredfold, right? Yeah. You find that when you're in a, a, a global church family like this, you have houses all over the world which you don't pay to maintain. Like I have so many houses in Nairobi. I don't know how much they cost. I just know when I show up, there is a room, there is a bed, there is breakfast. Have you ever thought about that? And that without following the call of God on your life, that's not possible. So, and, and many other cities of the world, uh, I have brothers and sisters because of the friendship that uh, we have with Pastor Emma and Pastor Carol. So, they are very special people to us, and I'm sure they are very special people to you. And I know I might irritate you eventually by the, how much I talk about them, but that's okay. Because if it irritates you, it means that the stuff was inside. It just was waiting to be surfaced. Hey. Is this Quietness Presbyterian Church? Or is this Mavuno? This is Mavuno. All right, I'm going to talk about discipleship and following this morning, especially following. But before I, I go there, I just, I just get a sense huh? that people need to know this word of wisdom. The devil, the devil's main work is creating orphans. <laughs> God is in the business of fatherhood. The devil is in the business of orphanhood. 
In fact, right now, more than 5 billion people on the planet don't know their heavenly father. Because of the devil's work. So he doesn't just stop at separating us from our heavenly father. He also separates us from other fathers that God gives us, including your natural father. Did you realize that most people have issues with their fathers and not their mothers? Did you realize that most people have issues with their fathers and not their mothers? And then you find that in every environment of destiny, God always provides a father figure. And the devil always tries to separate you from that father figure. Always. Just, mark, just watch your life and see if what I'm saying is not true. Even if it's at work. That's why people, have, people will always have most issues with the CEO or whoever it is that leads the organization or the department. Whether that's, okay, fathers, mothers, all of that. So I just want you to be aware of that. Even as we, we go through this week. I feel like someone needs to know that. Because you can make a decision that is separating you from fatherhood. My own father was shot dead when I was eight. And then we started a very, very difficult life as a family. I'm the last born of six children. Three years after that, my oldest brother was killed. And then a few years after that, my mother died of heart problems. So I know what the absence of a father means. And one time we were in a youth service at St. Francis. I think I was still at the university. I just left the university. And this guy who has come to preach goes prophetic and he starts and tells you, he tells me, God is giving you the heart of a father. You will be a father to many. <laughs> you know those things you hear and you're like, what a joke. Whether a joke is a name in one of the tribes in our country. But God is not into too many jokes because now I look at myself and I'm like, wow. Discipleship and following. Discipleship and following. Many times, I need to make sure my timer is working. Maybe here, then you see the sun setting. You're like, what happened? <laughs> Many times when we talk about discipleship, the focus is on those that should go and disciple, right? And if you're in this room, it means that you're a leader in the kingdom, and therefore discipleship is a mandate to you. Discipleship, ladies and gentlemen, is not for any type of specialized person. If, if, if you are a follower of Jesus, you must be a disciple and a discipler. And we've talked, 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 talked. In fact, Yeah, the opening session of Fearless last night. Uh, Pastor Newell Manufo was saying that the church is actually a means to an end. The end is discipleship. The church is a means to an end, and that end is discipleship. Amen. So you cannot be, you cannot lead the church which does not, which it's a bit like if you set up what's one of your good products from Kenya? Those days we used to import everything from Kenya. Nowadays uh, God created the heavens and the earth and everything else was made in China. <laughs> By the way, it's okay to laugh. Laughter is good for you. Yeah, A third of the kingdom is joy. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace and Joy. And you can't be one of those people who let, who requires us to be so spiritual to discern your joy. Like, we look at you and you really have to be like deep, deep to know that the brother is joyful because nothing on the outside shows. Mm. 
Where were we? China. Eh. Yeah. Kenyan products, anyone? Blue band. Do you still make blue band, you guys? So, uh, what? Ketepa. Okay. If T, okay. Let's say you set up a factory that makes tea, but the factory does not produce tea. But you keep paying salaries, workers come, what? Yeah, in, yeah, out. And like, this is a tea factory. But there is no tea that comes out. Once in a while, a tea bag will come out. Do you realize that there are so many churches, but there is very little discipleship going on? Yeah. We do everything else apart from the thing for which we are set up. We run services. Running services has nothing to do with discipleship. And remember, I lead a church that runs services. Oh, by the way, Pastor Angelo was so kind to me, brought me a very special seat from his office that I'm using this week. Now, someone may look at it and say, this anointing thing has gone too far. <laughs> now they are bringing the man a special seat. No, it's because I'm recovering from a back injury and so I have to sit on only certain kinds of seats and I walk around with my pillow. Is that okay, brethren? Please don't go taking pictures of the seat and, and I'm sure they're even zooming into the seat right now. <laughs> uh, guys, like, I came and they gave him a special kind of seat even when Pastor M was seated on a plastic chair. <laughs> it's pain, not anointing. <laughs> so, the church, church, friends, we exist for that sole purpose. Everything else is done in the context of making disciples. Now, that part, we all, at least as suspicious, we know, okay, even if we are not doing it, we know. You know, like, at, at worship harvest, you can't be leading at any level if you are not discipling. Yeah. Like, you can't even be a musician if you are not, if you don't have a, a group you're discipling. Sorry. I didn't mean to go that far. You can't be on staff if you are not discipling. Yeah, to be a staff member, you must lead a mission or community. Even if you are in the finance department. Because that's our core business. Yeah. That's our core business. Pastor Jeremy, here leads our media department. He, do, he went into the media department and made sure oh, everyone, you handle a camera, you lead the mission of community. Whatever, you're a photographer, you, you can't be around us and you're not doing the thing we are called to do. Because you, you do um, camera work or oh, type. What, I don't, what, it doesn't matter. It's our core business. That's why we have 600 missional communities. Because everyone leads one. Hey, how many are they now? 710. Like the other week they tell you 600. Then the next week they tell you 700. So I, 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 I don't know. Am I making sense? Now, one of the things that brings difficulty that people don't usually talk about is the other side of discipleship, which is what? Followership. You cannot disciple a person who is not following you. 
So every side has something to obey. The disciple must obey the command to disciple. The disciple must obey the command to follow, follow, following. Bishop Doug has a book, a whole book called The Art of Following. It's about following. And the advantages that come from following. You see, we've been sold this crazy idea that you should innovate everything. That's crazy. Innovation will rob you of your calling and destiny. You see, if we are to go from here to Kangemi, okay. Uh, <laughs> Machakos. There's a road, right? Now, if you get so clever and say, I don't follow other people's footsteps. I'm going to, I'm a pioneer. I'm a what? What, what are the other words we like to use? I'm a trailblazer. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm original. I, I, I'm not a copy of anyone. So you start cutting your own road to Machakos. By the time you reach, people will have gone and come back so many times. It's not clever. It's not wise. It's actually foolishness. <laughs> the lives of Savo, you people. Savo is so much farther down the road. <laughs> but, but look at what I'm saying. Because that's what people are doing. People are trying to cut a new road to Machakos when there's a big road that has cost people a lot of money to create. It's not helpful. Did you know that all cars are the same? At least those from Japan. Did you know all the cars are the same? Literally, they are all the same. When you, you get into the car, if you're going to drive it, there is a steering wheel, right? There is a gear lever to the left here, right? The accelerator is down. There is a brake pedal. And if it's manual, there is a clutch. The, there is a speedometer. There is an odometer. There is a thing for fuel. The, everything. There are wipers. There, is a, uh, uh, there are rear view mirrors. There is a windscreen. There is a... The seat. It's the thing. They just think Toyota this, uh, Nissan that, uh, Subaru the other. It's the same. That's why they make a lot of money. They are not wasting time saying, can we come up with the steering? No, no. Look, when people figured out you could have a electronic what? Uh, window, whatever. Everyone moved to electronic. You have you found people who are like, we are not going to follow those guys. For us, we still want people to exercise. <laughs> am, I, am I making sense? That's why they are ahead and rich and we are broke. Yeah. They're, no one is trying to be original. Look, what has advanced China? They just say, what are the Americans doing? Look, you can go, I'm told you can go and buy televisions. Lots of them. Then they'll tell you, which brand do you want it to be? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's true. They say, do you want it to be a Sony? Then when you say, then they put the things. <laughs> People are progressing. You, you're there stuck in ministry because you're innovating. Look, there is no point. And you know what is even more critical? Look, God in his wisdom has decided that you shall not live 900 years like Noah. Even if you are anointed. <clears throat> and you even a special chair. There is a limit. So your window is constantly closing. Yeah. I'm telling you. Your window is constantly closing. There is a window. There is a window for everything. There is a window within which you should plant a church. 
Yeah, I don't think you... I, there is a window within which you should serve God. It's not a case of after you've seen and the equipment no longer even works, then you're like, okay, now I'll serve the Lord. If you know, you know. There is a window in which you should take that church to a thousand, two thousand, three thousand, five thousand. Don't think it's forever. The guys at Azusa had a window. It was a three-year window in which they had to do what they needed to do for the church to be where it is today. There is a window. And because that window is short and always closing, look, if you really do well, you probably hit 120 years. If you do well. Even then, the energy levels won't be the same. There is a window. So, if you spend most of your life experimenting, by the time you figure out, okay, this is a good direction. Oh, people have gone. People have gone far. One of the greatest regrets of my life is that I started Worship Harvest Church, the church at 30. It was too late. If I had started at 20, okay, we we'll are still in school, okay, 25. It means that what I'm seeing now would have been what would be happening five years ago. If I'd followed the same what? Trajectory. There is a window. Stop wasting time. You see, all we need is a little humility. And we suddenly become useful in the kingdom. You can't disciple people who won't follow. You see, even the little that I feel God has worked in my life, it's been because of following. When we started the church, we knew nothing, nothing. In fact, people ask us, what is your advantage as worship harvest? Do you know advantage? I can tell it to you now. It's, so that is no longer a secret. We are a learning people. Look, all these people here, they read at least two books a month. I'm saying at least. If you ask them right now, what book are you reading? They will come up with a list of like seven books that they are concurrently reading. Or listening to on, what is that thing? Audible, some are audible, some are on scribd, some are on, uh, 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 there is physical, then what's the other Amazon thing? Kindle, whatever. The whole time. Because we followed Steve Jobs' advice. Remain what? Stay hungry, stay foolish. Look, for us, we know we are the idiots. And we know it. And we are not ashamed to say it. Like, everything we are becoming is because someone else figured it out. And then God decided that, okay, someone else has figured it out, but these, these fellows, they will not figure out that someone else has what? Figured it out. So let me get a person to come literally. We learned teaching from Andrew Womack. Yeah, because when we started the church, we didn't know anything about teaching, grace, what. And God brought a man who had been saved for only two years. He was going to a good church. He had a family of five children and his wife. And they came to our church when at the time, during praise and worship, there were only two people in the crowd and about 10 people on the stage because our church was meeting we the idea was to meet in a restaurant but after one sunday the restaurant owners figured so when jk didn't come to church you could really see half of the church hasn't come but this guy comes and he tells us you guys what do you do in your bible study we argue about things 
Should, why do people close their eyes while praying? Those were that, that was our Bible study. And I said, I have something. I have some material. Can we try it out? If you like it, we do it. If you don't, we quit. So I said, oh, oh. let's start on Tuesday. We used to meet Tuesday evenings at one of the guys' houses. He said, this Tuesday. So he brings the Andrew Mark Discipleship Evangelist because the thing, we're like, what? Is this, is this Christianity? That we already have eternal life. Salvation is by grace. Righteousness is by faith. Things we had never heard about. Who were like, oh my God, what did we get into us? That's how the church got established doctrinally. Because otherwise we didn't know anything we believed. And God is always kind because he always follows his word with what? Signs and wonders. That's the only way we could tell this is of God. Because first of all, our marriage was on the rocks. Not on the rock. <laughs> we had spent three years of a very bad, painful marriage. And then we, in the midst of that, we started a church. Don't do that at home. Like, it was so bad, one time I sat down in my sitting room and cried by myself. No, just cried. Wow. This girl, she used to be called Smiley when we were at uni. I had wiped the smile off. My friend, in just a few, like, two, three months, our marriage was like the exact opposite of what it used to be. Like, we looked at each other and said, what happened? What happened? The word was working even when we didn't know. My brother had been smoking from primary six. <laughs> Cigarettes. <laughs> Not fish. And then he became a chain smoker. By this time, when we start the church, he is non-churched completely. He starts coming to church. He gets saved. But he can't just figure out the smoking thing. He was so good at drinking, he trained people how to drink without being drunk. <laughs> but every, he did all he could, and he couldn't quit the smoking. And then just miraculously like that. After 32 years of chain smoking, Instantly. People, there was a kid who used to come to church with a crutch. All the people who were cohabiting, you know, when we start preaching grace, now all the people had been chased from the other churches because of their issues. Now ours was their church. People started marrying their spouses. Weddings, weddings. We saw so many miracles. We were like, this is of God. Mike Breen. There was this couple, they came to visit another church in Uganda. They went back to Switzerland where they came from. They are supposed to move to America. Then their visas were denied or delayed. Now they had already sold everything and they had nowhere to go. So they quickly figured out the place to wait with our money is Uganda. They come back as guests of that other church. They became our guests. They taught us Mike Breen stuff. We took it up. We became as if we are the ones who wrote the books. Following. What would worship harvest be without mission or communities? It wouldn't be a church. It wouldn't be the church it is today. 700, what? 10 mission or communities now because we followed Mike Breen to the letter. A friend of mine recruits me to the John Maxwell team. I joined the John Maxwell team. I'm like, what have we been doing? I discover there is a lot more to leadership than what I thought. You see, you don't know what you don't know. You don't know what you don't know. The only thing worse than the fact that you don't know what you don't know is actually not knowing that you don't know what you don't know. Because there is an island of knowledge you have not yet run into. Even though you think you know everything by now. Following. 
followed John Maxwell, started the Harvest Institute. It's all great now. Why following Pastor M, following Pastor M, learning how to reorganize and restructure the church? We were so organic. And I, I want to thank Pastor Njoro because when he was in Kampala, he's the one who introduced us to Mavuno. Yeah. And I remember you came to our leadership meetings and try, showed us what you do as Mavuno. And we just, whatever you shared with us, we adjusted, we made adjustments. Following has made us who we are and following will make us. Then Bishop Doug, I told you the whole story of one year, ten months of refusing to follow someone. And then the moment we did it, whew. amen. It's important to understand the importance of following and how it will save you time and its what advantages. Now, Mark one seventeen. Because people be like the guy didn't quote any scripture. Mark one seventeen in the New King James Version. I'm sure they're about to put it on the screen behind me. What does it say? Let's read it together. Uh huh. Jesus said to them, uh huh. Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. What? <laughs> he did say, read my books. Come to my class. Attend my services. Huh? What did he say? Follow me. And what's going to happen? I will make you do what? Become a thing that you have never been and will never be until you follow me. You know how to fish fish, even that you're not really good because you spent the whole night and caught nothing. Thanks so much, Pastor Carol. <laughs> even that you're not so good, I can help you with fish stuff. But for you to become a different woman, become a different man to become the thing you have never thought you could become you probably never even thought about becoming that thing if you follow me i will make you become that is the key you want to become something that you're not you have to follow someone who already is that thing why do I follow Bishop Doug? He has planted 5,000 churches. And we all know 26. 26 versus 5,000. You get all your wise cards and whatever. You put it in a small piece of paper, pocket it, and follow the person. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Is he worthy? This is the verse, by the way. This is it. Follow me. How do you become? You follow. You follow. And you're not following, is we are following. <laughs> we have all these questions about what following is. No, it is the person is going that way. You follow, you go where they are going. That's how you do it. Don't try to fix the English. Following is simply. Where the person is going is where you go. And then you become something else. I'm not against uh, seminaries and other training institutions of the biblical nature, but unfortunately they are designed to shortcut that process because you find that in many seminaries, one of the other guys calls, it, calls them cemeteries, but I think they are seminaries. <laughs> You find that the people who teach, the professors, actually are not practitioners of the thing they are teaching. That's why we have people coming out with very big heads and a lot of theology who cannot make disciples. Hey. 
Who can't build churches? Who are you following? Because be careful, whoever you're following, you're going to become what they are. By the way, the anointing is not a feeling. Jesus said, one of my favorite scriptures in King James Version, the wind bloweth whither it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst tell whence it cometh, or whither it goeth, such is everyone that's born of the Spirit. <laughs> you're, you're really, really tempting me, but I'm resisting temptation right now. I'm fleeing. No, fleeing is for a certain kind of temptation. Only one kind that must be fled. <laughs> you, you, the, the wind blows. And says, such is everyone who is born of the spirit. How you know that a person is anointed is not how you feel. You look at the effects when the wind blows, you see the way the trees are swaying. Oh, that's wind right there. When you see a ministry like Mavuno, the size and impact it has, and how far a tool like Rooted has gone to change lives globally, you would be... Oh, there are words we can't use in church. No, the one I was going to use is not in the Bible. <laughs> Maybe the Jamaican version. But you would be a certain way not to understand that these people are anointed. Because you want your, li your right leg to be shaking when they walk near you. That's why you say, I think these people are anointed. My right leg is shaking. My right leg is shaking. Your right leg shaking is a very little wind effect compared to thousands of people who have come to know Christ and are being transformed both in this church and other churches. That's how you know they're anointed. It's not because of the kind of uh, uh, KJV English and spiritual speech that showeth thee that these are men and women of God. For behold, thou mayest not tell if thou art following such feelings upon thine heart. But if you are wise enough to look around, just look around and see uh, how much land is this? Are you with me? <laughs> Those people are here to follow. I don't, I don't know what, who they are following. <laughs> Those are the effects land is this? You think, you think land like this? You are many churches. Do you know that I have land like this? You see, it, it, the pro problem is we lack wisdom. That was one verse. My time. What's, what's wrong with my clock? Who's corrupting my clock? John 10, 27. John 10, 27. By the way, this is Jesus talking, but it, it works even in this context. John 10, 27. What does he say? Uh -huh. My sheep hear my voice and I know them. And what do they do? do what? Uh, what? Pastor, pastor, the word pastor. What's the other word, English word for pastor? Shepherd. Do you know that the, in the wisdom of God you are called a shepherd? In others, you're supposed to have what? Uh, and what are they supposed to do? Follow you. One, hear your voice and then follow you. My sheep hear my voice. Yeah. Now you're going to sit there in your theological seat and say, but he's not accurately interpreting the scripture because that talks about Jesus. Okay, you go and find the one that talks about you as a shepherd that has that is not this one. <laughs> and tell me that that one supports the idea that your members should not follow you. 
or whoever you're discipling. Do you have a contrary scripture that supports the idea that people you're discipling should not follow you? Mm. Hallelujah. Hey! Second Timothy 2 2. Pastor M. used this one last night. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses. I'm going to expound this tomorrow and another time. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, what? Commit these to faithful men and women. And don't tell me hey, that's not in the text. It's not in the text, I know. Faithful men. Yeah. I've found that when I commit them to faithful women, also the effect is the same. Who will be able to teach others also? Do you realize that he's telling him that things you've heard from me commit. For you to be an effective discipler who commits things to others, you must be hearing. Anytime you're saying you're discipling, the next question you ask you, who is discipling? Who are you hearing? The things you heard from me commit to faithful people. How do you know they are faithful? They are able to transfer them. They are able to transfer the same things that they have heard. Amen. I, I feel like I'm preaching better than you're listening. Give me First Corinthians 4, 14 to 17. So that we proper like almost end this quarrel. No, it's not a quarrel. Like just get into it. So this is Paul. Okay. And he starts. Hey. Is that where I am? 14. 14. Is that where 14 starts? Uh-huh. Let's read together. This one. This one, by the way, if you don't read it, you might not believe it. So let's read it together. What does he say? I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. Now this is Paul writing to the Corinthians. What does he call them? Beloved children. I'm like, but Paul was single. When did he get children? Okay. For, to get next verse. Next verse. Uh-huh. For though you might have what? 10,000 instructors on YouTube. Yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten this the gospel. In other words, fathers are few. Yeah, you can't go around going everywhere. Oh, this is my spiritual father. This is my spiritual father. Oh, I have about 58 spiritual fathers. Now, you, you have swung from orphanhood to something else, not sonship. <laughs> but I can tell you, the devil wants orphanhood even in the church. The devil wants you to just work in the church as a servant and not a son in the house. That's what the enemy wants. Because as a servant, your followership is very different from that of sons and daughters. He says, uh, you may have many instructors. There are many books. There were, look, if you are in Mavuno and you are even on staff at any level in leadership, you should have read all Pastor M's books by now like three, four, five times. Otherwise, you're drinking a different spirit. And you're going to try to bring it here and you wonder why, why is there contention? Look, these people have learned that the most excited person who's preaching they should be excited about is me. Yeah. It's not Bishop Jakes. Bishop Jakes is an astounding preacher. 
preacher. But he's not the pastor of worship harvest. The committee did not choose him to pastor. Mavuno Church. You have many instructors. Just go on YouTube and you can binge watch sermons for a week. But if you want to grow in this movement, those people and whoever they've told you to listen to, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, you ask yourself why are there very few anointed people in the world? You should always ask yourself that that should bother you. The Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost and has never been recalled. Why is the anointing so hard to come by? Because we lack the wisdom that goes with understanding anointing, anointed people, and how to flow in the Spirit. Ask yourself, why, why do we have very many small churches with all these sinners around? Oh. Sorry, I'm bringing uncomfortable conversations. It's because, uh, you see, if, if, have you ever met, those, those, have you ever collected rain? I know like in Earth River it barely rains, but in some places where it rains, there's that place where two roofs meet and there's a valley, right? And water collects there. Usually, if you don't have piped water, or even if you have and you're into water harvesting, you need to put a, a, a thing where the valley releases the what? The water. Now, if in your wisdom you say, God, you are my God. You can make anything happen. I'm not going to follow this humanistic thing. I'm going to put my drum or whatever it is in the compound. And Lord, if you are God, when it rains, I want you to concentrate the rain into my drum. And God is like, son, please take your drum there where the thing is. I'm like, but why? That house was is man-made. Me, I want supernatural rain into straight into my drum. You will be with little water. There's a reason people have little water. They've refused to humble themselves and roll the drum to where the roofs meet. I said, they say, this man who has led this church to where it is now. And what? There is something God has put in them that I want. It's called followership. And of course, some people who think they are clever will say, but we are called to follow Jesus. Okay, go follow Jesus. <laughs> go follow Jesus. When you find him, eh? Please tell me. Because I'm also looking for him. But the window is closing. While you're looking for Jesus, you've been to Machakos, Kangemi, what, Avi River, Vika, Rongata, Rongai, wherever, Langata, Mongo Hills. You are very fine, Jesus. Savo. Tighter heels. <laughs> and then the Jesus you're looking for tells you, there is Paul. Follow him. Like Paul, Paul, there is Morithi. Follow him. If you don't want to add pastor. Mm. Eh. Look, if you're looking for someone perfect to follow, I recommend that you accelerate your departure to heaven. Mm. For therein thou mayest find. Because the Bible saith that thou hast come unto the uh, yeah, to the spirits of just made made what? Perfect. If you're willing to follow a spirit, you'll find perfection. 
if you're looking for something wrong with Mose, hmm? you not you not just find it. You write volumes, <laughs> volumes. <sighs> Ten thousand structures. This is not of what many fathers. There it is again. You don't have many fathers. Pastor B3, get a mic and come here quickly. We are out of time. For, therefore, I urge you, imitate me. Have we reached the imitate me part? Next verse, people. There. You, is it there? It's the next verse. If you press like this, uh, you see? <laughs> therefore, <laughs> I, I, this is Paul. What is he telling him? In, in another verse, he says, imitate me as I imitate what? Christ. But here he says, imitate me. You're like, Paul, do you know Paul had issues with you people? Have you read 2 Corinthians chapter 11? Have you? you I told you, get, have you read 2 Corinthians chapter 11? The guy had issues. What? Quarreling? What? Eh. But this is, Hmm? I imitate me. Why? In the gospel, I begot you. You see, the moment you join Mavuno Church, you have already decided who you are going to imitate. <laughs> ah, now you see, he says, imitate me, and then he says something else. Very interesting. The next verse. The next verse. What does it say? Ah, this one, you have to read it, believe it. Uh -huh. For this reason, I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. Now, can you imagine Paul is telling people to imitate him, but he's sending someone else. That for this reason I've sent who? Timothy. He will not remind you of my words, no. He will remind you of my ways. He will eat the way I eat. He will pray the way I pray. He will preach the way I preach. So for you to imitate me, just look at what Timothy is what? Doing. Can you confidently say that if people wanted to imitate Pastor M or Pastor Carol, they just look at you? Start from here. What are we doing? <laughs> we are talking about followers. <laughs> this is one of my beloved daughters. <laughs> we have had enough fights in this life, but here we are. Yeah. She's for signs and wonders. Yeah. There's a guy called Moses Kalanzi. Yes. He's in her we started a mentorship program for pastors of other churches. Now, of course, they came thinking they are going to what? To be mentored by me. Then they found out, I distributed them, and then they are mentored by all these people. So Moses Kalanzi is in her group. When Moses Kalanzi is from a place called Mpiji, it's just out of, of Kampala. When Moses Kalanzi joined the mentorship group, he had 70 people in his church. 70. Are you understanding? Seven zero. How many people were attended Moses Kalanzi's church? By the way, remember we are in lockdown. Churches are not allowed to meet. So these people are meeting in missional communities. He adopted missional communities. He's doing missional communities better than us. Yep. How many people met in Moses Kalanzi's missional communities this past week? Uh, imitate me by switching on. It's Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> 2,735. 2,000 from 70 in February. February. This year. This year, 2021. To 2,700 in August. He's a hard follower. 
hard. There's another guy called David Waswa. He's, he's another guy. He came to Harvest Institute. He came to our school of what? Ministry. ministry. Everything I do, he does. He, we have MC Live. He has MC Live. Yeah. When we release a song, they sing it in their church. Like crazy stuff. But they are growing. Those guys, some of those guys have labored for years. Eight years. And the church has 50 people. Now, all of them are going hundreds, thousands. In a, since February. Anyway, talk about your own following story. Whatever you want. T tell us what you want to tell us. You see that thing? You see there's a paper there? Yeah. So don't follow me in terms of how much I take to preach. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Apostle. My following story. I'm going to squeeze it as much as I can. So I joined Worship Harvest when I joined university. I, I came into the chapel and they were singing. They were a music team. They were not a church. So I... I immediately came for their meeting on Tuesday and started hanging out with them. They were, they were as loud as they are now, loud bunch, very happy, made me uncomfortable a little bit. I was used to Christians being serious. They were happy people, timekeepers, highly accountable. And that was my whole university was swallowed by worship harvest. I was so, I was with them going on mission, just with them. But shortly after joining, because I joined towards the end of 2004, and in 2005, Apostle says God has told him to start a church. Hey! Now, of course, things get a bit complicated. But I, 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 in when I just joined, one of those days, I remember it was raining on a, on, on, on a weekday and I was praying in the chapel. And I heard God say to me, that man is your spiritual father. I didn't know what that meant. I had, was coming from the Anglican church. This whole idea of spiritual fathers was very strange. And the instruction was to tell him, I think God wanted me committed so that I don't jump out of it. I went and I told him. He looked at me and said, what does that mean? I said, I don't know. He said, okay. And that relationship began. So for me, when he said he was starting a church, it wasn't difficult because I thought, if that's my father, I think children follow fathers. So I'm going to follow. So we plant. Uh, we really joined him on the planting journey 2006. And life begins. So the journey of following, in my mind, I was following. Honestly, if you looked from the outside, we were part of the church plant, uh, apostle. Then we were dating, my husband and I, Jeremy, were dating at the time. He asks us, eventually, when we get married, he asks us to become elders. We first say no because we were clear. I remember Jeremy kept telling me, I am not a pastor. I will never be a pastor. Don't even start thinking about it. I'm like, yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> And so we first feared that this might be a step to make us pastors. Eventually asks again, we join the eldership, we, we take charge of leading worship harvest katikati at the time when we had the first uh, multiplication for Nalia, when Apostle moved with a group of elders, we stayed behind. We were caretakers. He was supposed to send the pastors. They've not yet come. So we um, then start to lead there. So we led. Um, I, I remember that for... Most of my university life, I was like his handbag. Everywhere this man went, I was with him. Like it was just, I was with him. I had time on my hands. Sometimes I would cut classes, not recommended, but I did it because if he was going, I was just with him all the time. And so I, I, I'm going to tell you some of the results of that. First of all, if you've ever sat with Apostle Mose in his car, what's your experience? It's called just a little bit fast. A little, you're praying tongues all the way to your destination. And so one of the things that happened to me is that when I learned to drive, uh, I only know one way to drive. <laughs> yeah, people usually are praying in the car when I'm driving. I can't understand moving slow at any time. So the, I think that's one of the results of following. It's not that I tried to become that I don't know how else to drive. So um, started, I remember the first time he made me teach. We had gone together to Entebbe. It was a youth conference. He was the teacher. We were just talking in the car. When we got there, he stood up and said, I came with one of my leaders. And then he told me to teach. I was freaked out. Like, who does that? Apostle Mose. So just like he has done to me now. So uh, we went and, and I, I taught, I don't even know what I said, of course, and he started to try to affirm me. But eventually he started to insist that I teach. 
which brought problems because people started to leave the church. She's a, she's a, a woman. Uh, first of all, she always telling stories. Who is this? The worship leader is now a preacher. What's going on? Hate mail. All, and I would go to him and he'd tell me, you keep preaching the gospel. Everything will be okay. What happened for me? I had a father in Apostle Mose. What did he do? He covered me. He gave me opportunity. Um, he opened doors for me. He's still opening doors for me. But our relationship was not without issues. I saw myself as a worker, even as a daughter. So remember, I know this is my spiritual father in my head, but I'm working for him and I need his approval. And so I found that I was following, but not really, not as hard as I could. We've been labored following where you feel like there's an obligation. And so I was in. I want you to know that we led a location, we planted churches, we got to a place where I think you call them network leaders. My husband and I were leading a cluster. And last year in January is when God showed me that I was not planted in the movement of worship harvest. After 14 years of being deeply involved, quitting my work to being, I wasn't. I was a worker. How? For me, I was waiting for the day God changes my assignment. Yeah. Yeah. I was there and I was faithful, but I was like, you never know when that. So every time we had an issue, I would think, is it time? Every time we had a fight, is it time? When we had a big misunderstanding, maybe God is telling me my season here is over. And some of you are in that position. You're leading, you're faithful, your heart is, you, if, you, if anyone asked you, you'd say, this is it for me. It's not that I had another church I desired to go to, never. But I always wondered, when will I be leaving? And you know what, what happens when you're like that? You're not all in. You, don't, you, you, you think you're giving everything, but not really. I got to a point where I was working. The same thing, like now when you're here in the service, others are listening, but you're busy checking what's happening. Is the, is the sound okay? I, I didn't even listen to the someone a lot because sometimes I would say, I've had him teach. Oh, that one I know. I, know. I even know that joke he's about to crack. You know? And so I would be looking for a deeper preacher who can help me as a minister. Because, yeah, he's always deep and he's good, but... I've had it all. It's been 14 years of hearing the summons. So he'd be teaching and I'd be bored. I'd be waiting for when maybe I'll get home and listen to a deep preacher who, maybe someone he recommends. And so his voice was not really the dominant voice in my life. Sometimes he'd be preaching and I'd be arguing in my mind. I, think, mm, I don't know if I agree with that. And sometimes I would have conversations about him with my husband after the summon. Did you hear what he said? Me, I think he was trying to instruct me. I think he was passing something to me. So, yeah. Don't pretend like these things don't happen to you. You know what I'm talking about. We had one of the things that, it's a heart issue, this following thing. So for me, this was not really my, he was my father, but not. But also I had a warped image of fatherhood because I was an orphan. So for me, the father in my life was a person who provided security. Could you just... Speak into that a little bit. A, so a little bit, okay. The background. Background. There. So my, my father died when I was eight years old. It was sudden. He fell ill, two weeks passed on, and I was immediately moved to live in the countryside, in the village with my grandparents. We were divided immediately, my siblings and I, to different families. My mom died shortly after as well. And I was raised from home to home. I wasn't your usual person. When I was at, at, at throughout secondary school, Holiday time, I would make a call to ask my primary caregiver, where am I going for the holiday? And they would tell me, oh, auntie so-and-so has had a baby. They'll need help. That's where you'll go this holiday. Next holiday, so-and-so, their maid was fired. You'll go there this holiday. Now, this one needs you back here. Oh, maybe this is a longer holiday. You need to go to the village to help with the grandparents. So I never had a stable home. So what I knew was if there's a father figure, you adjust. You be good. Do what you're told. Stay out of trouble. Do your very best. But then maybe you'll never get their approval. Maybe you will. So there's the, you, I desired his approval as a father, but I had a wall to protect myself in case I don't get it because I was also used to that. So our relationship, I remember you'd keep telling me, I don't know if I know you. And I'd, in my heart, I'd be like, I can't be myself around him completely because I don't know if it's safe. Because will he like me? I need him to see that I, because work, I can work. I'd make sure whatever I'm given, and then if I felt that I had failed, then I knew he's about to chuck me. So what do I do? Protect myself quickly so that when he does, I'm okay. And many of us are like that. You work. 
You want to receive the person of the father. It's so dangerous. The fatherhood thing, it means vulnerability and potential danger. So for me, I found that I had a wall. I had so many bad conversations. Not like, like evil, you know, but unnecessary conversations about Apostle Mose. Not with too many people, but with my husband. I'd be complaining how he's not seeing how hard I work. He's not, you, you know, does he ever see how much I do? Because it's always about what I'm doing. And I want you to see me. I want you to, I'm not a, I'm not a daughter. This is not my inheritance. I'm working here for approval. So even the ministry, I did what I could with all my heart, but for approval. Not because this was, it wasn't mine. For me, I was helping. I was there to help Apostle Mose fulfill his vision. Now, 2020, we start to learn some things. I remember it was 17th January. We were praying. We were, I think, I'd, I don't know, it was a prayer evening. It was season 21, right? And I remember the Holy Spirit just speaking to me in that moment and saying, this is your father. And you need to, like, covenant here. You know, like when you get married and you make those dangerous promises till death. This is your father. Because you don't quit fathers. You don't quit mothers. You can't have an ex-dad. An ex-mom. So if there's an option to leave, that's not my father. I'm working. Guys, I worked hard. The people in worship harvest have started sharing this story with them and they are shocked that our pastor, a network leader, one of the foremost leaders in the ministry was not planted in the ministry. I wasn't, but I didn't even know it. But you see, the problem with that is that everyone behind me was stuck along with me. That's the problem. That while he entrusted me with the mission, and he was, and he was frustrated with me, I knew it. And I was confused about his frustration because I was doing everything I knew how. That's why yesterday he said, it's by revelation. To be able to get a revelation that this is my father and what that means to be a daughter. If I could explain to you in words the freedom I have received in ministry. Because now, this is it for me. They, this is my dad. I even tell him he's also stuck with me. Because he can't chuck me. You can't undaughter me. He has to figure out how I have to succeed with him. This is my father. This is my home. Worship harvest is, I'm not helping him. It's personal. This is our ministry. It has to work. It has to succeed. It, you understand? I, it's, I found it impossible now. When I used to be praying, Lord, help me to stop talking against Apostle Moses. I don't pray it anymore because I, I can't. You see your dad, even when he makes a mistake, you cover him. It's, it's our nature. You cover the things at your home. You don't want people to know some of the weaknesses your dad has. You explain away why he, I don't know, eats a certain way. He did in the bedroom when the guests came. You come up with a story about a long day. You always, children protect fathers. So if I'm exposing him, he's not my father. This has become the dominant voice in my life. And let me tell you, I am so excited when Apostle is teaching. It, there's no explanation. Like, he's, he can teach the thing in the morning. He comes and teaches it in the evening. And I'm just like, is this is so good. Say it again. You know, like, you're, this is the best teacher for me in the world. But you know what happened? And I'm not pretending about it. But what happened is that revelation. So we started to do things. For example, my husband and I started to listen to him at home. Can I tell you, in all the years we were in worship harvest and we were leaders and we were on the core team, we didn't listen to his sermons at home. No, we listened to him when he was preaching live and I was distracted most of the time. And at home we listened to the other instructors on YouTube. They were so good. They were so deep. They had unique revelations. These ones, we were used to them. Guess what? Those unique revelations never helped me to flourish in the ministry and in my life. So we started, it was awkward, I won't lie to you. Hearing Apostle Mose in our house. Hey, why is this man in my house? He's in our bedroom, we're hearing him talking. Now it's so normal. When we're in the car listening to him teaching, we are laughing at the jokes, we are talking back to him. And so sometimes you catch a thing you never caught in the sermon. Sometimes you hear it again, you're like, he said this before, and then we are listening for instruction when he's teaching. Now I think he's even more careful. Sometimes he has to say, this is not an instruction. Because if he dare says, last week I stopped taking sugar. Thank you. We're no longer taking sugar. Um, 
if he says, ah, I started saving 20%, great. So from this week, we are starting to save 20% of all our income. It's that way. Because that's what following is. Is that you do what the person is doing. You go where they are going. Their way of life becomes your way of life. What they desire becomes what you desire. And, when you, and what happened for us is that in tandem, the people who we lead, they follow us. It's scary. We have to also say, this is not an instruction. Because, and before it wasn't like that, you'd have to beg them, cajole, sometimes threaten, you know, so that they do what you want. Now, you have to be careful because they are listening. Everything we do, they do. Everything we teach, they teach. And guess what? They are so excited about Apostle Mose. When he comes to our location, they are more excited about him than us. Why? We are excited about him. We are always talking. Before, he'd be coming and you'd be like, huh? We are in trouble. You know he's coming. Stress. Stress. What is wrong? What's not right? You know, everyone is on tension because that's what you're passing on. But now, th this is the voice they're excited about. And you know what's happening? Sons and daughters. For me, mm, that, that, the greatest gift, I think, now, at least for me, in our lives, not only in the ministry, but every, it's like everything in our lives suddenly is working. Our finances have grown expo exponentially. Our marriage is great. Our children are happy. It's like, I can't explain it, guys. I feel like I've just started be being alive. Why? I've tapped into the thing that Jesus said. Only when you follow someone. Because he was trying to make me become. Apostle Moses did the John Maxwell certification. I was the next person and he took me on his ticket as a relative in the family. Because they gave a relative's discount. And he gave it to me. I went on that ticket. He's a straightforward financial growth coach. I am. He's an author. I'm an, author. I'm an author. He drives fast. I drive fast. He's a disciple maker. I'm a disciple maker. He's a church planter. I'm a church planter. He's a teacher of the word. I've become a good teacher of the word. He's a timekeeper. We are working on that. So that as you follow, you become. So I, I, that's what I desire for you. May God open your hearts to see how far you can go if you receive these people as your fathers and mothers. Because God wants to move us forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, friends. Thank you, Pastor B3. I'm so proud of you.